Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, February 18th, 2010. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Les Howarth, author of the Home Brewers Recipe Database, joins us to talk about his book, a guide to the ingredients of nearly 3,000 commercial beers from around the world. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter. I'm Basic Brewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. You can find our show page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we definitely appreciate your support. You can also use our associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. And I'm sure that they appreciate your support as well. The big talk right now among craft beer lovers that I follow and who write to me is about the new 41% ABV beer. The uh, Scottish brewery Brewdog has released Sink the Bismarck, which they're claiming is the world's strongest beer. 41% alcohol by volume. I don't know, but they've got to be concentrating that stuff, right? Kind of like we did with our... Ice beers? I'd like to try it, but the price tag is around 40 pounds for a 330 milliliter bottle. That's around 63 bucks for around 12 ounces. If you taste it, let me know what you think. It'd be interesting to see what that's all about. Adam from Pella, Iowa writes in with this. Adam says, if you haven't heard any of the buzz, we homebrewers and beer lovers are excited about the bill that is nearly passed to raise the ABV for beer in Iowa from 6% to 12%. Excellent. Yet more progress in the beer-related legislation arena. You still can't, you couldn't couldn't get uh, Sink the Bismarck there yet, but, you know, (laughs) it's closer to it. Uh, You can follow the progress on the the Iowa efforts to raise the cap uh, on Twitter. At Iowa Beer, all one word. Good luck, guys, up there in Iowa. Guys and gals up there in Iowa. I got several positive comments following last week's show with uh, Scott Mathis's yeast experiment where we found the, that the uh, Kolsch yeast strain was the best, apparently, at showing off the hops in that pale ale wort. Uh, Kurt from Prince George, British Columbia writes, I was just listening to the podcast with the experiment with the different yeast strains, and I had a question about the cold strain. I'm a hop lover myself, but I'm wondering if this yeast will accent the hops too much, which will throw off the balance between the malt and hops in the beer. Uh, Kurt says, uh, I've either read or heard John Mayer from Rogue Ales say that his Pac-Man yeast allows the malt flavors to come through to compensate for the high level of hops he uses in his recipes. I'm wondering if the Kolsch will do too much of the opposite. Well, that's a great question. Too too much hops? <laughs> uh, seriously, you might have to figure in some rebalancing of the recipe to get the, uh, the hop and malt character uh, balanced the, in the way that you're used to even if you are unbalanced. But uh, you may be able to use that to your advantage and use fewer hops. Who knows? I want to try around with the, uh, try to play around with the uh, uh, the Kolsch East Strain and some hoppy beers and see what happens. Talon from Central New York had this to say. I listened to the yeast experiment episode and was surprised to hear the three of you talk about the lack of carbonation in the California ale yeast sample. I brewed a California Common in November and had the same problem. It took several weeks of conditioning before the beer had a head out of the bottle. I fermented on the cold side, but the yeast is supposed to brew cooler as per the package. That said, now the bottles have a nice carbonation level and head, so perhaps this yeast just needs more time. Another good point. Uh, Given more time, 
especially at the warmer time of year, the various yeast strains may even out as far as the carbonation goes. Uh, I wonder if Scott has any more samples put back for later tasting. Maybe he could give us an update when uh, the beers have a little more time in the bottle. I appreciate that, Talon. On a similar subject, Bill writes in with this, I've heard discussions on several podcasts now wondering about how long a beer will last given various storage conditions. I must say, I don't know. However, I do recall a rule of thumb from my chemistry classes. That rule was that a reaction will generally double in rate for every 10 degree increase in temperature. Not sure if it applies as we are talking about microbiology more than chemistry here, but I thought you might find it interesting. That is another good point. We're talking about microbiology with the yeast, but we're also talking about chemical processes with oxidation and other factors that uh, affect the flavor of the beer. So you might want to keep that in mind when you're cellaring your beers. That would be a fun experiment. What happens with uh, beers that you keep cellared for a certain amount of time at certain temperatures? What? Uh, how does that affect the beer? Finally, Chris from Colfax, Washington, sent me a link to a story. Chris says, I heard this on NPR yesterday and thought it may be newsworthy for your program. It's regarding a million-dollar grant to OSU uh, to develop, uh, and that's Oregon State University, to develop new aroma hops. Seems like there are too many choices already to me, says Chris. (laughs) Too many choices of aroma hops? (laughs) <laughs> Chris says, uh, now I may have even more indecision on brewing day. Well, that's the kind of indecision I like, though. The uh, article says that the million-dollar grant is from Indie Hops. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more about that. I hope they find some interesting new uh, aroma hops to give Chris more indecision on brewing day. <laughs> Appreciate everybody writing and uh, commenting and keeping me updated with things going on out there. But now let's get on to our interview. I'm always looking for uh, I'm always looking for brewing books to add to my library. And the uh, latest acquisition that I have is the Home Brewers Recipe Database by our guest Les Howarth. It's not a book for newbie brewers necessarily, but for those who know their way around the mash tun. It's a fun and useful book that's a peek into what goes into beers from around the world. Well, Les Howarth, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Uh, Thank you, James. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Now, you are uh, appearing via Skype across the Atlantic Ocean over there in England. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, you have written quite the book. Uh, but before we get into the book, uh, I want to get a bit uh, of information on your background. Introdu- uh, introduce yourself and your history in home brewing. Uh, well, I'm originally from Liverpool, and I started brewing in the late 70s uh, with the, the kits that were available at the time. And I fairly quickly got fed up with them. Um, the quality wasn't that great. And uh, until I came across, a, I can't remember whether the beer came first or the book, uh, but I came across a recipe for a beer called Abateil, which at the time was my favourite. And the recipe for that was uh, involved strange ingredients like pale malt and crystal malt and hops. So I had to do it from scratch. Um, if I wanted to try and reproduce that beer at home. And so I I attempted it with without the right equipment, and I had a day which I describe as a comedy of errors, um, sort of filling my mother's kitchen in Liverpool with grain and water and uh, other effluent, shall we say. <laughs> and I produced this beer which was nothing like Abbott Ale, um, but it was, uh, at the time, the best beer I'd ever brewed. Ah. And I I decided it was a great beer, but it was just too much effort. <laughs> so I went back to brewing the kit beers for a while, and 
a, a few more years of that, I thought, no, I've had enough. I'm going to have to go back to Orgrain and do it properly. So I went down to a homebrew shop and I bought some equipment. And as they say, never looked back. <laughs> Carried on learning ever since then. <laughs> what was the uh, state of the uh, ingredient selection at that time in the 70s uh, when you did your, your first uh, all grain batch? Uh, was there the variety of ingredients over there uh, that you can find nowadays? Um, no, no. There, were, there was a limited number of grains. Uh, it was pale malt, crystal malt, black malt chocolate malt, um, roast barley, I think. Uh, you could get things like flake maize and flake barley and maybe six or seven varieties of hops. Um, the quality was variable. <laughs> <laughs> we were probably scraping the bottom of the barrel, getting the stuff at the end, you know. But I could still brew very good beers with this. It was, it was good. Charlie Papazian says that uh, when he first started home brewing, he didn't know hops were green. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I I heard a story about somebody who'd been brewing for a while, and they returned hops to a homebrew shop because they were green. He thought there was something wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I generally used brown hops. <laughs> yes. These things are green, and they have this pungent smell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. These often had a pungent smell, but it probably wasn't the right pungent smell. <laughs> it's stale, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, home brewing uh, over there in, in in the UK is is uh, gaining in significance because a lot of the uh, uh, the better beers are in danger of disappearing. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I've seen the brewing industry in the UK has changed a lot in, say, the last 30 years. Um, it's sort of gone up and down with various cycles. And at the moment, uh, uh, you know, there are a large number of uh, pubs um, closing down every day. Hmm. Much. Um, I think it's the, the taxation system. It's just become very expensive to drink out. Mm. Uh, it's obviously um, good tax avoidance to brew your own, as well as often being better quality, of course, these days. Yeah. Are the uh, the American big boy brewers uh, getting a foothold over there? Um, there has been a lot of that historically. Um, t to be honest, it's got so confusing at the moment. I don't know what the state is. There's, there are big brewing groups that buy other big brewing groups and you don't know whether American, British, Belgian, South American, South African or Australian, whatever. It, it's, I, I don't think anybody knows who owns who now with certainly with big business. That's true. Um, unfortunately, with the bigger breweries, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of got the way. It's just, I think they've lost touch with the customer. It's all big branding and marketing. Uh, but fortunately, there are a lot of smaller breweries who are still producing the real thing on a small scale, and there are some very tasty brews to be found. If, but you you need to search them out, which of course is all part of the fun. You know? Now, one of the uh, one of the tools that home brewers can use to help uh, uh, maintain good beer anywhere in the world, I guess, is yeah. is your book, the Home Brewers Recipe Database. And uh, it's now at an, its second edition. Uh, but yes. how did this get started? Uh, well, when I first started brewing, I, I mentioned the, the Abbott Ale recipe. That was from a book by a guy called Dave Line called Brewing Beers Like Those You Buy. And my copy of that, it was, well, I've still got it. It's very well thumbed and annotations in it and uh, spillages of wort and beer on it and I didn't try all the recipes in there but I tried a large proportion of them and some of the recipes you know, I, I brewed seven, eight, nine times and I reached the point where I wanted to try brewing other beers that weren't in the book and I didn't know where to start I sort of invented a few recipes, recipes on my own um, but that was kind of the state for 
a few years until I came across a series of, well, it became a series of books called The Real Ale Almanac by Roger Crutz, where he had tasting notes of all British beers, and for many of them he had ingredient information. And uh, there was one beer in particular um, which became a favourite of mine when I was at university in Bristol uh, called Smiles Exhibition. And it, all I had for Smiles Exhibition was pale malt, crystal malt, chocolate malt and Golding's hops mm. for no proportions. So um, I think we're going to come on to this later, but I, with that limited information, I had to start trying to recreate my own version of Smiles Exhibition. And I, going through all these, these, um, this ingredient information in, in the Real Ale Almanac, um, over the years I, I, I found it was difficult. If I wanted to brew a given beer, I'd have to start searching through an increasingly large number of books to try and find the recipe I wanted or the ingredient information I wanted. So there was a phase in my life where I had a bit of time on my hands and I started entering this information into a database for my personal use. And over the years, this database grew, and I reached the point where I thought, I think other brewers might be interested in this. So I published it, or effectively self-published it, as uh, a book, published on demand book. And I made a lot of mistakes with it. It's far too big and far too expensive, but... That was the first stage. And having published the first edition, I carried on and I found further sources of ingredient information, uh, other books, um, the internet, of course. And I have I sort of developed almost like um, an obsession, I suppose. <laughs> Anywhere I found any ingredient information for a commercial beer, I would make notes um, and... You know, basically trying to grab as much information as I could. And this got added to the database until it reached the point where I thought, this is enough information to publish a second edition. And having learned the mistakes of the first edition, I re-edited it to reduce the size of it and so on. And uh, that's the scenario where, where we are now. The, the second book was published last year. Again, self-published. So we're talking about almost 3,000 beers. Yes. Yeah. From almost 1,000 breweries. Yeah. Uh, and all compiled in this, this one book. Uh, now, you, yes. you, this is a compilation uh, essentially of, of ingredients uh, from other sources, and you have uh, credited all the, the other sources. Yeah. Uh, now, this is not a... Uh, this is not a book for newbie brewers, so to speak. I mean, you, your first batch of beer, you're not going to grab this book and then find a recipe that you can, uh, with confidence, uh, brew up a, a clone, right? No. No, this is definitely a book for someone who has a bit of brewing experience. Um, they need to be confident enough to design their own recipes and have some knowledge of what their own brewery is, is able to produce and how it operates, um, brewing efficiencies and such like. Um, because I, I found myself with recipe books, um, I'm, I was always adapting them. The volumes wouldn't be quite right or the efficiencies wouldn't be right for my equipment. So I would always have to adjust the recipe anyway. Mm -hmm. So I decided rather than try and create recipes, I would just give the basic information or as much information as I could and leave it to the brewer to design their own recipe from the information given. Now, some of the sources uh, uh, we would be familiar with over here, for instance, uh, Mark and Tess Samatolsky's uh, Beer Captured and, and uh, yes. uh, Clone Beers, and then uh, uh, Jamil Zanishev's uh, book as well. Uh, yes. And then Stan Hieronymus is uh, Brew Like a Monk. So yes. uh, if you want, if you need more details than you fi find in this book, and you might, uh, then you could you could search out those original texts 
And you probably Absolutely. should. You probably should have Absolutely. those in your library anyway, right? Yes. <laughs> I, I, but there is another aspect to it, which is uh, copyright law. Um, you can't copyright copyright a recipe, and you certainly can't copyright uh, a list of ingredients. But you can copyright a collection of recipes. So, books with collections of recipes, such as those you've mentioned. Uh, it would be illegal for me to republish the recipes, and I wouldn't want to do that anyway. Right. So I would hopefully what I've done in those cases, I've given enough information, say these are the ingredients, this might be your shopping list, but this is where you find the recipe, and you, you then have to go off and find it yourself. So it's a kind of an index to some uh, slightly detailed index to some other recipe sources. Uh, but if, again, a, a source of data um, just has recipe uh, ingredient information, then uh, I'll re reproduce that as faithfully as I can. Now, the, de the level of detail in each of these beers uh, varies. Uh, yes. For instance, I'll just take one at random here, uh, Avery IPA. <laughs> One of one of my favorite beers. Uh, it says original gravity ten fifty eight malt bill pale malt Munich ten level bond malt caramel one twenty level bond malt hops Columbus Simcoe Crystal Centennial IBU sixty nine and then source averybrewing dot com. Yep. So you know, like I say, a newbie brewer wouldn't know what to do with that. No. So where do we go from here? If we want to make an Avery IPA uh, from that list of ingredients, where do we start? Um, well, you try and get whatever clues you can. Um, if you have an indication of the color of the, the beer, you may get an indication of the proportion of the malts uh, in, in the malt bill. Um, but the approach... I tend to use um, is, a, is a scientific approach called the binary chop, where what I would do is um, from uh, various sources and some homebrew books are, are good for this, as well as the internet, of course. For each type of grain, they will usually give a maximum recommended amount. Now, I would tend to take half that value, since the binary chop, you split it in half, so for each speciality grain, I would divide the maximum amount by two, and that would give me a first draft, if you like, of a recipe. Hmm. And the balance would be the pale malt, your base malt. And I would look at that and think, does that look right? <laughs> Bit of guesswork here, but if you, if it looks like there's way too much chocolate malt and it's supposed to be a pale ale, then okay, you'll you'll reduce that down a bit and a bit of guesswork. But then with your first draft of the recipe, you you brew it and then you taste it and you think, well, did I get it right? Um, uh, you, one of the things I've found this, this approach is good for, it, it teaches you how to detect the effect of the different ingredients. So you think, oh, the, the chocolate, malt, chocolate malt is maybe a bit high, then I want to drop that down a bit, uh, or and you try and analyze the flavor, bearing in mind what the ingredients are, and try and adjust things in the right direction, the, um, the, the malt balance, and the, the, the bitterness, and the hot flavors, and so on, as best you can. And there's no better way than doing that than experience and tasting beers and knowing what's in them. Um, and I certainly can't recommend recognize most varieties of hops but you can try you've got to keep trying you know it's it's a hard job but you <laughs> keep trying to um improve your skill as a brewer i think and <laughs> understanding the effect of each ingredient on the final result so <clears throat> what i might do is if <clears throat> then if an ingredient was if i thought um i'd use chocolate malt as an example if i'd say use five percent and I thought, well, that's too high. I would then chop that again in half, a second binary chop. And for my second 
uh, a tenth of the recipe, I'd use two and a half percent. Um, the other ingredients, if one well, I thought was a bit low, I would then go halfway between what I chose and the recommended maximum. So you, by doing that, where you're kind of playing it a bit safe, if you're within, if you're only at fifty percent of the recommended maximums of the ingredients, then the end result shouldn't be undrinkable. Um, you still should get a good beer out of it, you'd hope. Um, and that's it's effectively the way I would do it. It's a, a trial and error approach, but I found the binary chop approach will should mean you get closer to the end result quicker than straight trial and error. Hmm. Uh, at least that's the theory. Now, the the, uh, uh, the beauty of this approach is that uh, in experimenting around, you might find a beer that uh, or a, a recipe that you like better than what you were shooting for. Absolutely, yes, yes. You, you never know what you might discover. Now, what what size uh, batch do you work with to experiment like this? Uh, I always brew um, to fill a 19 meter corny these days, so it's is that. Um, Four UK gallons. I think it's about five US gallons. Mm, okay. That's, that's the batch size I use. So fairly standard. Yeah, yeah. So, the, but the, there are uh, there are lots of brewing software programs out there that uh, uh, brewers nowadays can take these ingredients and plug them in there and take a look at, say, the IBUs or the color. Uh, yeah. Or you know, there are even charts that uh, the programs have built in that say whether you're matching a BJCP style guideline or not. So, you know, there are there are ways that you can kind of uh, not cheat, but use modern technology as a tool uh, to help you uh, discover these beers. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, I've found the brewing software to be very helpful in that respect because you can play around with the ingredients and immediately see uh, the effect on the colour and the bitterness and get an idea for the balance and if it's within style or not. And, of course, the beer you're brewing may not be fit within the BJCP uh, style guidelines anyway. So, um, as I said, um, you, you can break rules. It's all part of the fun. Right. Yes. Now, one book that that I've found most useful in in uh, formulating my own recipes was uh, Ray Daniels designing great beers. Yes, yes. But uh, you've yes, also you, a very good book. You've also got uh, formulas in here as well that will help you in uh, establishing uh, an original gravity, uh, formulating your malt bill for toward that uh, end. And then uh, some IBU calcu- uh, calculations, some some color calculations as well. Yeah. Uh, so, but what are some what are some guidelines as far as we've talked about the malt bill? Uh, what are some yeah. guidelines as far as hops? Um, with, with the hops, if you if you don't have the, all the information, um, I would there are the. Generally, hops are categorized in, as either bittering hops, um, aroma hops, or general purpose. And you can kind of use that as a clue. If a brewery uses, let's say, two varieties of hops, and one is a high alpha acid bittering hop, and the other is an aroma hop, then it's probably not too unreasonable to think that the high alpha acid bittering hop goes in at the beginning of the boil, and the aroma hop goes in towards the end of the boil or it's dry hop. So you've got a reasonably good logical starting point in that case. Another thing I've done, if it's not that clear, I've, um, there's, there's a, um, a brewery, a uh, Crouch Fail, I think it is in the UK, where uh, I've, I've brewed a few of their recipes where they have four different varieties of hops. So what I've done with that, I've just done a 25% mix of each variety of hop and mixed the the four hops together in equal proportions and then used a proportion of that mix at the beginning of the boil, another proportion at the end of the boil, and so on. So I've got the same proportion of hops at every stage in the process. 
and I've no idea if that's right, but it's it's a starting point. Again, you can't go too far wrong adding an aroma hop at the beginning of the process. And in this case, they were, they were all kind of traditional British aroma hops. So you get the feeling it could easily be all the way through the process. Now, one tricky thing uh, that I've found is that uh, once you start adding a lot of hops later on in the boil, uh, the traditional formulas uh, that are, say, in these brewing applications, uh, like Daniels and Rager and Tenseth, and they, yeah. they all wildly vary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like uh, we, don't, we don't know yet exactly what to do with late hop additions, do we? Um, no. Um, I... I tend to just go by taste. I've found that if you add hops, say, 15 minutes towards the end, that seems to me to be too early. I tend to add my late hops five minutes before the end, or even you, know, you turn the heat, turn the, the flame off, effectively, and you throw the hops in there and let them soak for a few minutes and then uh, start straining them off. So I my approach is to try and give the late hops as, as little opportunity to, to develop any bitterness, um, which has the advantage. You, you, it kind of keeps things simple. So when you taste the beer, you know where the bitterness has come from, hmm. hopefully. Um, and obviously, depending on the, the beer and the brewery, that may not be that authentic, but it's, it's a starting point, and I, I find it easier to do that way. Unless I have information that says otherwise, of course, but um, that's that's generally the way I approach it. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. And again, um, with with varying sources, uh, you get varying uh, amounts of information. So yes. uh, in some, you get more exact proportions uh, of, say, the, the, the grains, for example. Uh, and yes. others, others, you have to do a lot more head scratching on your own. Yes, yeah. But uh, one one of the most interesting things I found was the index in the back of the book where yes. uh, you list all the ingredients so that if you are, say, like someone sent me from the U.K. the other day some elderflowers. Yeah. Uh, and I made up a little, uh, little mild, a little brown mild uh, with that. And I noticed that there are five beers listed in this book with elderflowers in it. Yeah. So that you know that would have been an, a good uh, resource for me to kind of look at and get an idea of what other brewers have have uh, used uh, elderflowers for. Do you, have yes. any, do you have any experience with elderflowers? Uh, yes, I have brewed with elderflowers, and I like the results. Um, what I actually did, and uh, what I tend to do a lot, a lot I use the database um, to design recipes. Very often for a beer I've never drunk, I've got no idea how close it is to be, being a clone. But I'm not too worried about it. It's usually an excuse to try a new ingredient, uh, you know, a new variety of hops or whatever, or elderflowers. And I will work on the basis that if a given brewer has got a commercial brew that uses elderflowers in this style of beer, then presumably it tastes nice, or at least somebody thinks it tastes nice. So I think that's a, a good starting point to try a new ingredient. Um, so that's probably 80% of the way I use the book is, is in that way to, to try out new ingredients. And in the case of elderflower, I, it was a recipe actually for uh, Freoch uh, Heather Ale, mm. and I couldn't get any Heather or um, the ingredient, uh, bog myrtle. So I decided to um, design a recipe based on Freoch and substitute the, the, the flowering heather and the bog myrtle with elderflower. And obviously it wouldn't be a clone, but it would be replacing something vaguely flowery with something else vaguely like a flower. Hmm. And... The, the end result, I, it, it, yes, uh, it went down well. So, <laughs> um, 
the I mean, again, the other way, the obvious one in recent years with the, the hop crisis is that if you have a variety of hops and you want to use them, you can look at substitutions. So you're kind of using second-hand data from the, from the book to, um, you know, um, for example, my wife is... Um, I'm diverting slightly here, but my wife is from Argentina, and I uh, have been able to obtain a significant supply of Argentine Cascade hops. Hmm. Now, all the books say that Argentine Cascade is nothing like U.S. Cascade, and I would agree with that. It doesn't have the same grapefruity characteristic, and they say it's kind of more like a Halatau or a Tetanang or something like that. And none of the recipes in my book use uh, Argentine Cascade. So I thought, well, if we say it's like a Halatau or something like that, I will use a recipe that uses that sort of hop and substitute the Argentine Cascade and see what the result is. So I kind of sort of, this sort of double, well, the substitution of ingredients, again, I, I think it's worth trying. If you, if you can't find your, a recipe with um, okay, Swede, for example, you look in the book and there's one recipe that uses turnips. Yeah. Turnip yeah. Swede, more or less the same thing. <laughs> That's an extreme example. I've never built that one. <laughs> now, you've got, sure. speaking of Argentina, you've got recipes from Argentina to Zimbabwe. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, what, are, what are some of the more unusual recipes uh, that you've come across? Oh, um, well, I, I essentially go by ingredients. I mean, again, the, the recipe that uses turnips, um, I think there are one or two recipes that use oysters. And I have drunk a commercial oyster stout, uh, especially an Irish brewery. And it was very nice. I recommend oyster stout. Uh, it doesn't taste like oysters, but it's very nice. <laughs> um, and having uh, updated the book, there are certainly some ingredients in there which were new to me, like grains of paradise uh, crops up in several U.S. recipes, and I've never used them. But I, if they're that popular, I think I want to try them out. Um, so, yeah, there's a range of strange recipes there. <laughs> I see a recipe like, yeah. I see a, re a recipe using rose hips, and uh, some friends of ours, uh, Jen and Casey, were <clears throat> going to brew a, a Valentine beer uh, this past weekend with uh, rose hips. Sounds appropriate. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking uh, before we started recording that, that beer is – fairly forgiving in some sense. I mean, if you look through this book and and get inspiration for a recipe or see some ingredients that you haven't used before and you want to just kind of explore, if you get it wrong, you can still get it right. Yes, yes. Um, it's very unusual to produce a beer that's completely undrinkable. <laughs> uh, um, I think this... I mean, the advice I gave earlier is have, being aware of what the maximum amounts of ingredients are recommended. Uh, I've, I've, I have a friend in uh, Scotland. I, I lived in Scotland for 11 years, but a friend in Scotland who brewed a beer using a, I can't remember how much he used, but he used a large amount of cocoa in it. Hmm. And when he told me what he'd done, I, I, I think you've overdone that. And um, yeah, he said it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go, you live and learn. Too much of a good thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Moderation and everything. <laughs> Are there, uh, and some of the titles, uh, Roaring Meg. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's some great beer names, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> Whistle Belly Vengeance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> old grumble uh, <laughs> i just i just want to i want to brew up a, a kettle of old grumble uh, yes <laughs> but uh, what what is your what is your best advice i mean maybe not even uh, toward uh, making a clone recipe but 
what is you've been brewing for quite a while what is your best piece of advice especially for new brewers coming on I would say the most important thing and it's something that I don't always do very well myself is you've got to keep good records you need a notebook you write down exactly what you've done as best you can and um, the other bit which I often miss out on is when you taste the beer at the end, try and make as good tasting notes as you can so that uh, a few years later you can go back and if you want to try it again, you can look at it and you think, how did that turn out? And um, there's so many beers I've brewed where I've brewed it, I've drank it, and I look back at my notes and I've written nothing about how it tasted. Oh. And so, uh, you know, what do you do? I've got to brew it again, I suppose. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I would say try and keep... Um, you, you can't keep too many notes, any little detail that you write down. At some stage later on, as you gain more experience, that you know may be a critical piece of information that you can use again in the future. So that is my main bit of advice. And... Obviously, it goes hand in hand with that. You've got to taste the beer and judge it critically. Be your own worst critic. And invite your friends to be uh, critics as well. Yeah, well, friends... Well, I, I think there are two categories of friends. There's friends who are not home brewers who tend to be polite, uh, but home brewers tend to be a bit more honest. Mm. If they taste something wrong, they, they know... But you won't be offended. So the, the generally brewing friends can be a bit more honest. And of course, there isn't that much opportunity for, for this in the UK. But if you enter beers into competitions and get feedback from judges, um, that can be very valuable. So there aren't many competitions over there. Uh, there's not that many. We we there's, there's, um, we're not as organised as you're in the US. There's the Craft Brewing Association who has an annual homebrew competition, which uh, I'm hoping to attend for the first time this year. And uh, Scottish Craft Brewers, which I, I was a member of, I still am a member of, they had occasional competitions. Um, but it's not um, as big or as organized or as regular in, as in the USA. Could it, be, could it be that Americans are a little more uh, competitive? Could be. I don't know. <laughs> yes, could be. Could be no bad thing. <laughs> if it means you produce better beers and and you do produce some very good beers, then yes, yeah, keep being competitive. There you go. So what's yeah. next? Is there going to be a, a a third edition? I would hope so. I think. I mean, this whole process of gathering information. Um, it's. I wouldn't say it's taken over my life, but it's come a sort of. A bit of an obsession, you know, if I have a, a few hours free at a weekend or something, I'll, and I'll sit down and go into a book or search some brewer's websites or whatever and just keep adding to the book. And to say the second edition came out not because I'd run out of data or data sources, it was just because I thought it, it seemed right, it was time for an update, and I'd got enough um, new information there that I thought was worth doing. And I would hope that, I don't know, in a few years' time, I would have gathered enough new information to do the same again. So I think it's going to be a life's work. <laughs> <laughs> there, there could be worse. <laughs> Indeed, that's terrible, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Les, I, I appreciate your, uh, your coming on with us, and uh, I appreciate your advice, and best of luck with the book. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me again. Well, thanks again to Les for taking time out to talk to us. Now I am intrigued about turnips. <laughs> Will they mash? <laughs> On another note, uh, I hope to get together with Steve soon to taste my elderflower beer that uh, I was talking to Les about. I'm looking forward to that. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our 2010 Brewer's Logbooks are still available. And uh, 
as well as our Reinheitsgebot is a four-letter word shirts on our shop as well. You can check out our homebrewing DVDs, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. And uh, we got combo deals to save you a couple of bucks. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products uh, this week that were purchased through the link are Dangerously Funny, the uncensored story of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. I got to see uh, the Smothers Brothers live at a little nightclub in uh, the Vapors in Hot Springs, Arkansas, when I was in high school. Funny guys. Uh, there was a guy in the audience that kept shouting, CBS! Kind of took away a little bit from that show. And, uh... <laughs> Ooh, digress city. Uh, the other thing that was uh, featured uh, in the Amazon thingy this week, Bowflex Blaze Home Gym. Wow. Something that I would benefit from as well. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just uh, click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. And uh, you can also visit our associate links to the American Home Brewers Association and Brew Your Own Magazine. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.